Hey, what's up? It is Striker. Welcome to Tune on Toast. Hit that subscribe button as we are building this community. And I want to give a shout out to Velvet Hammer Music and Management Group. They said, Striker, we love your podcast. Keep doing the episodes. We have your back. Thank you, Velvet Hammer. Now let's get to another episode. This is Tune on Toast. AFI, Corn System. Our guest today, Bino, manages all of these bands. But which t-shirt should I wear? Maybe I'll just wear my sweater, my sweater. No, somewhere. Oh, he knows you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Who is it? It's Dino. It's, look who it is. Hello, Dino. Uh, thank you for coming over. Wow, I like the flavor. Thank you. You've made it to Tuna on Toast. Dude, I've been smelling, tasting, Wanting, craving, <laughs> give me some fucking tuna on toast. Yeah, do it. Dude, this is great. I Thank you, Bino. Wow. Thank right? you. Tom DeLong from Blink, he hated this. I did not choose this. It's from the uh, Rose Bowl swap meet, FYI. By you the way, can, I, I, love, I love lions and tigers. Yeah. All right, Bino, watch your head, watch your feet. Welcome. That's for you right there. Yes. There, yes, we're yes. here. Let me close this. Yes, yes. We're locking yes. ourselves in. We have the Avenge before it's even out here. Life is but a dream. <gasps> you don't respect wood. You don't oh respect wood. Oh, 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 whoa. And that's like, for me, it's like, I'm OCD. I'm like, how, like I get mad at people when they're in my house and they don't put a coaster down. I just, I miss that. This is life changing. <laughs> that Bino does not respect wood. And on that note, <laughs> let's start the show. Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Tune on Toast. It is Ted Stryker, and today is going to be a good one. Open up your ears. A lot of music education and inspiration is coming your way. He is the CEO and founder of Velvet Hammer Music and Management Group. He's at my house in my guest bedroom, Bino! There he is. How are you, my friend? I'm doing great. How are you? Great to see you. Always. It's, it's great to I see you. I love that familiar voice. It's just like, it feels like rain when you're, un, when you're under the covers in bed and you hear that rain. It's like, that's Stryker's voice. Wow. Thank you, man. When I think of Bino, I think of bands like System of a Down and Corn, And I think of AFI and Alice in Chains and Avenged Sevenfold. And the way that you have worked with these bands slash brands over the years has made millions of people happy. And I'm leading the charge on all of that. Yes. Big, you've been such a supporter for so many years. I remember coming into, you know, K-Rock or meeting you and be like, dude, you got to play this. And you're like, I'm getting this on. I'm fucking getting this on. I'm going to get it on. And you'd hit me text when we had the little rim pagers. And yes. Like, I'm playing it for Catch of the Day at 420 at 4 <laughs> yes. whatever. Like, and I'd be like, oh my God. And we'd all huddle in my little office back then and like hear you play a system song or a Deftone song or whatever it was. And it was just so invigorating. So there is so much to get to. I want to know all about you and how you got to this place. But I... Just want to start with System of a Down. Yeah. Uh, and let's go back to that day where I played Sugar on the radio. When you first started working together with System, was the goal to be on the radio? When I met the band, I had gone out to a rehearsal to see them. And at the time, Shavo and Darren were basically, you know, Shavo did the business and Shavo and Darren were sort of managing de facto. And Shavo was interfacing with me so much. And 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 I just started hanging out with them and and I had such passion for what I saw. I wasn't even driven by the business of it. I just saw this band and I was like, this is one of one. You know, this is something that is just it's 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 unparalleled in terms of its musicality, in terms of its ethnicity, in terms of its time signatures, just what they were doing, how are they doing? Serge coming with the growls and Darren, this dude with braids, and they were banging and it was like, whoa. <laughs> so I just I just was so allured to them, you know, in terms of the art that I started hanging out right. with them and I started showing up and I just became, I just started to manage. I just started to take the bull by the horns. I'm like, I want to do this. I want to do that. And Shavo really, and Darren really Shavo on the day to day, but Shavo and Darren were really doing the business of it. And Shavo just started to trust me and, and, and him and Darren discussed it and, and Serge and they, and at the time the drummer and they, they let me manage them. Wow. And so we never chased anything, but what was incredible about the band, whatever it was, you know, they had this thing going on. And these fans would come and they were fervent and they were intense. And it was not just a show. It was a religious experience. For sure. And yes. like that is what I wanted to capture and expand upon. And that had to be done slowly. That's not a quick thing. 
And so you got to let, you had to let that thing develop at the rate it was developing and what was right for that. And so that's what we did. We just sort of encapsulated this beautiful, very rare, novel energy, potent as hell. And we just let it swell slowly, but surely. And then it happened, started to happen. So Bino in 1996, seven, 1998, where were you in life? Were you someone that wanted to be working within the arts or music or sculpting or painting or clothing design? Like what was going on with you mentally and professionally then? Right. So I went to USC and I finished in, I think, 94. Um, and I just started going to shows. I was just, I loved Because you were a music guy? Loved music. I would always be at the Whiskey or the Roxy or the wow. Opium Den. Or, yes. You know, lingerie or whatever whatever club, <laughs> club was having lingerie. this. Yeah. And, and a friend of mine who was actually in a band called Proper Grounds, that okay. guy Osiri, my dear friend, signed to Maverick, his first signing as a youngster, um, said, you need to come see this band, System of a Down. In the valley, and I, I was like, I never heard of him, so I went to the valley. Guy with him. said to you, no, a, a, someone from a band called Proper Grounds. The okay. guy had signed. Got Zen, it. Xenophon Frank, Xenophon Frank Lang the Third. Hi, Zen. Um, and so we went out there, and I met the band. And again, the the inspiration and the enormity of emotion took over. Like I didn't, I didn't know I was going to be a manager. I didn't oh, know wow. about the business. I yeah. went home that night and I asked my dad, you know, to loan me the first year of law school money if he was going to pay for law school. I was like, and he's like, welcome to grad school. And he loaned me a check. He wrote me a small check. I figured it out. I made stickers. I made posters. I did whatever I have to do. And and, and all, I just- All system of a down. 1,000% focus on these four guys. Uh, at, yeah, I was 26 years old. It was all focus on them. And that's what I did. And I, and I just figured it out and- the band was incredible and the band figured it out and together there was something that was working with, with the band and I, and, and they had these fans that were swelling and it just became this beast that was a slow moving beast and it never stopped. How did you earn the trust of those guys then? And is it the same thing in 2023 to earn an artist or a band's trust? Is it the same thing then as it is now? That's a good question. I mean, the most important thing to me as an entrepreneur and as just a person is trust, right? If my clients feel protected, if my clients feel like I'm delivering, if my clients feel good, that makes me feel good. It's never about the money. We all like money. It comes when the greatness is there. Yes. But it's about the trust because if they trust you, I believe that they're at ease to create their art. If a band is in the studio and they're feeling good about life and, and, and trusting the team around them. I believe they will achieve a greater sense of self, a greater sense of expression, a greater sense of ultimately the art. And nice. so if, if, if there's one legacy I can leave, it's, Hey man, Bina was an incredible manager and he is, his word was gold. The results were there, but his word was gold. Th those two things are important to me, results and trust. For you personally, as a manager, how involved are you, and let's keep it with system, when they're recording songs with Rick Rubin, are you in there going, oh, that's great, guys, you should do this? Or like, what is your role on that side of it? Well, obviously, working with Rick Rubin is different. You don't really say, hey, Rick, I, <laughs> no, I, I, want, I, I want to see that, go, that middle eight go into, uh, go into a different thing, take out the guitar, change the top line, Rick, come here. <laughs> um, I bet, but speaking of Rick, I was so fortunate because Systems, my first band, um, and I got to work and be in the room with Rick Rubin recording System of a Down. And the I learned- The debut self-titled album. And I learned- Started off with Sweet Pea there. And I learned so much. I mean, and, and, and like he would, I would watch and I'd ask questions. I was 25, 26 years old, 27 maybe. And, and he would make the smallest adjustment and it would have the most profound effect on a song. So I got to watch Rick and this incredible band system. And I was in there, I was intimate. I was the fifth member. Um, so I was always with them. But you know you had you had Darren Shavo, John and Serge, four hugely talented guys, and then you had right. Rick right. extracting greatness and like challenging them on parts, and you had Darren, this crazy writer, and Serge, this quirky singer, and Shavo, who comes from this low end, you know, this just in the pocket, and John, who's a monster, and together it was just incredible what they created, and I watched. Wow. And now you know, twenty five years later, yeah, I mean, I do, I do A and R some of the records. I do get involved. Certain bands with more than others, but certain bands are more collaborative. Certain bands, you know, want the input. Some don't. So um, I, I, I read the room and I know my role. How coachable 
are young bands. Like when Rick was talking to the guys, were they open to suggestions at that time in their career? Yeah, I think some bands are, and the the great ones put ego aside and they and they <clears throat> they try things. Um, Rick has had a huge huge effect on System um, in the studio, and um, I think it was it made all of them reach deep and, and challenge themselves. You know, um, they're they're such a unique group. You know, they all bring something to the table. I mean, Darren is obviously the architect musically. Um, Serge is a one of one singer with just, yeah. you know, the ability to, to go into character and, and articulate lyrics and top lines like no other. That's just, you don't see it. You've never seen it. You never will together harmonizing what Shava brings and John and the rhythm, you know, the power of John, you know, the, the, the low end sensibility and warmth of Shava on, on the bass, you know, sometimes it's complicated, sometimes it's simple, but so it's, you know, it's, it's, it's bittersweet because the band is, is is so dear to me, but at the same time, um, we don't get to see enough of them. We don't. And yeah. what I said in the intro when Shavo was on this podcast was, we need to stop asking, when is there going to be new music and how many shows are you going to do this year and just enjoy the moment when they do play. Yes. Because if we can live in that moment and hear sugar and toxicity and forest back to back to back, yeah, it's a 10 out of 10 excitement for everybody, man. Yeah, it is. It is. And that's the way I feel about all my artists. You know, I don't manage a lot of artists, but I, I'm inspired by them, which is why I'm motivated, which is why I believe that Velvet Hammer can bring to the table what no other company can because I feel like these brands we are so inspired by. And I never do it for the business of it. I do it because I want the art and the logo and the set list and the production and the tour and everything about them to be so perfect. Okay, here we go. So many things based on that. There are some musicians, and I'm not saying they're bad or anything like that, that just want to get one song and they're thinking about the short term. If I can get this one song, this one click, I'm going to have a career. But it seems like you, when you looked at the bands that you work with, and you just called them brands, and I want to ask about that in a minute, you have always thought about not the next two months, but what's going to happen the next 10 to 15 years. Am I on the right track with that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, look, um, songs are songs, you know, systems had some big songs. Deftones had change, you know, Avenged has had big songs, you know, same with AFI and Alice in Chains and Korn. They all have, but those songs are a catalyst to tap into the culture. Yes. They swell the culture. If Deftones never have a radio song again, they're still going into the forum. Avenge just sold out the forum and they haven't had a record in six years. System of a Down, you know what they do. And they haven't had a record in 15 years. Right. So I believe that if a culture of a band is real, that attracts me. And my job is to make sure that that culture is fed. Record, no record. Tour, no tour. Song, no song. It's great to have songs. Believe me, Deftones are going to make a record. Korn's going to make a record. Alice, they're all going to make records. You know, right now... Right now, Avenged Sevenfold's top five at radio, and it's great, but it's a, it's a it's a factor that's peripheral. The brand, this brand of Avenged, is thriving. It's the art, it's the ideology, yes. it's the tour, it's the show, it's what the band does live, it's what they they do artistically, it's their death bats, it's everything that that makes up the overall brand. And the songs and the records are very important, but I don't ever manage to have a hit if it's there. Amazing. Do we love it? Yes. Chop suey. Fuck yeah. Change. Yes. Hell to the king. Bad country. Yes. You know, dirt. You know, fucking. Yes. You know, them bones. <laughs> yes. You name it. You know. Oh, yeah. You know all Miss that murder, stuff. Miss murder. Miss murder. I mean, <laughs> AFI went in and sold out the forum. The celebration celebration of the twenty years. I mean, yeah. Came and sold out the forum. You know, right. twenty years later. You know, they haven't had a song on the radio in a while. But that brand and that record and that record brand were seminal and still are to this day. Hugely influential. So if when I get involved with the band, um, I need to know that it's more than a song. I want to know that it's more than a song. You want more than just a two-year shelf life. We're like, oh, kid, you did good for two years. Uh, sorry, you got nothing left and right. we can't do anything for right. you. And with that being said, enormous songs are enormous songs. You know, the Beatles had enormous songs. You break it down to an acoustic and yeah. a top line. It's like, oh, my God, you know, you can hum that forever. You know, when I first met One Republic... I went to the what was then the Key Club in Hollywood, right. which is now one of next door to the Ro the Roxy, right. by the way. Yep. And I went downstairs to see this band, and Ryan Tedder walked up. There wasn't even a stage; it was downstairs. It wasn't even on the stage upstairs. And 
And I watched Ryan and those guys play apologize and stop and stare. And I, that next day I was like, I have to sign him. And I knew nothing better than what I heard. And at that moment, I'm like this guy has hits and he, and he has been a seminal hit maker. And Ryan Tedder is an incredible writer. Yes. He writes for other bands. He writes for his own band. Right. That's an instance where the guy is just a hit maker. So he may not need, and that band may not need as much culture around it. But the hits are just are, are plentiful and they just keep coming. So in that regard, that's great. I don't manage them. Um, my good friend Ron does and he's done a great job with it. But that's 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 a different thing. That's not what that's not what the core of what I do is. A question about you referring to the bands as brands. Has anyone ever like had their eyebrow raised up like, what do you mean the band is a brand? That sounds they're not Coca-Cola. They're right. not whatever it is. Right. So how did you come, like, how did your mind work to get to that place to call, to say the bands are brands in a good way? Right. I think the first couple of times I said to people, like, you mean your band? I'm like, well, because I don't look at these as, it, it is more than a, a band. I mean, you know, it's the t-shirts, it's the ideology, it's the beer, it's the coffee, it's the show, it's the publishing, it's the sync, it's the licensing, it's the appearances, it's whatever it is. I mean, that's, that. I don't want to look at it as limiting. I don't want to look at corn or Deftones or System or Avenge or AFI or Alice or anything I work with as a limited thing. Alice in Chains, when you say that word or corn or any of the bands, like I can go to any part of the world and say Deftones or System or Avenge and people know it is. I want people to see the A7X and be like, I'd wear that on a shirt. I'd watch it on a record. I would do anything that has to do with that. I believe in that. I believe in that brand. That's their, the A7X is their Nike swish. Right. Right. Absolutely. You see that white pony yes. and you're like, okay, am I wearing my white pony day or my Adidas three stripes? That, <laughs> that's what I want. The backwards R K O R N. I mean, I'm like, you see hey, that I see corner. Jonathan Davis when I see that. So, so in that regard, like uh, why you know, limit the reach? Right. Have you ever had a short term goal where all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, the short term goal with this band is going to ruin the long term goal. And you're like, wait a minute, we can't do this. It's going to be great in the next six months, yeah. but not good for three years. You know, part of, part of building the trust factor with the bands is also as their manager and someone who participates in the income, part of the trust is also encouraging them when to say no. Mm. And ultimately the band will have, will make the decision. You know, they are the band, they'll make the decision, but I have certainly made it very clear in many instances that I don't think we should take this deal or this situation and and take the money right now because of a greater thought and, and a long-term goal. And I always say that if there's a shelf life, then take it. If there's no shelf life, slow and steady wins the race. And I believe that the bands I work with, the brands I work with, none of them have a shelf life. And we're proving that because they're all, they are all bigger than they've ever been. Can I ask you about corn? Absolutely. Absolutely. I became a huge fan of theirs in the nineties, specifically at a Rob Zombie corn show in Tucson, Arizona. And like, I, I was like, Oh my God, what is this? And from that day on, I love the band. Then I got so lucky to work on the radio in LA and be like, I can back these guys verbally and deliver intros of songs with my own style, not just press and play, but this is how they make me feel. Right. And here they are in 2023, bigger than ever. Yeah. What do you love about Corn? I mean, first of all, the band is so collaborative. Like these are guys that have sold 40 million records. <laughs> they're a they're a headliner. They're an arena sellout. They are, you know, they're bigger than ever and it's never about ego for them. Like they are so collaborative. Jonathan Davis, who is quite ar arguably one of the best front men ever in rock. Maybe even underrated by the way. I mean, maybe under under, I think he's in like top five for me. He's incredible. Yeah. But here's a guy who will be like beans, check this out and, <laughs> and want to know my opinion of things. You know, that's, yeah. that's there. There's such humility there and there's such tangibility. Um, you know, they're they're an incredible band that is that has grown into such a distinguished place. Um, their show, their profession, their their professionalism, um, the attitude. They want to win. You know, there's a band that wants to win. Competitive they're, within themselves to do well. They're not ambivalent. You know, they're like we want to win. We want to win. We 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 want to get to that place. We want to be better. We want to challenge ourselves. We want to be the best. And I love that. I want that. You know, I never want to rest on laurels. Right. Um, obviously, you know that 
that front three, that line come out on stage and you see these guys and just, just like, it's so potent. You saw it last week. It's so powerful. Um, just the brand itself. It's just so nice to see them getting theirs. Um, and you know, they also like to be challenged. You know, these are dudes who want to be poked and challenged. They're better when they're challenged. And I love that about them. I think they're Do great. you have to do the challenging on them ever? I, oh, I, I certainly absolutely challenge them. That's why they have me. So how do you do that? So how does it work for you? You got A plus level rock stars, your A plus level manager, super confident, but you're going to these guys, going to Jonathan and telling him something maybe he doesn't want to hear and it could lead to uncomfortability. They, Jonathan is so great because he has said to me before, we need to get our asses kicked. We need to be told we suck. <laughs> That's the mentality he has of, of really looking inward to saying, is it that good? Do I have the best product? Is this the best set list? Is this the best production? And that's how Brian, Monk, and Jonathan are. They want to be challenged. I don't believe that I'd be managing them unless I brought a sense of urgency and and pushing them to the table because they're they are better because of it, I believe. And with that being said, sometimes I have an idea and they're like, no, nah, we're good with this. We're good with this. And that's fine too. But I think the greats want to be challenged. To me, corn has always been way up here, but maybe six, seven, eight years ago, they were still doing stuff, but it was like for the public, it was a little lower, but they're back up higher than ever. When did you start working with these guys? I started with them about seven years ago. Jeez Louise. Good I mean, <laughs> I know you love them. <laughs> and, but like, that's the last seven. It's been like, they were already big, but it's, astro- it's huge now. It's crazier than ever. Well, we, we marketed a certain way and, you know, you look at Deftones and you look at Avenged and you look at, they're all marketed different ways, but I believe these bands have a, a, a tremendous amount of allure. If, if you encapsulate the greatness of what they all are, AFI's greatness is pure to AFI. It's different than Corns, different than Avenge, and they do different things beautifully, and they have a different um, ethos that attracts in a different way. But if you do it and you really find what they're amazing at and what they are, yes. and it's real, yes. it's gonna stick at, at at different levels relatively, you know, relative to who they are. I believe that, you know. So it's 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 amazing, you know. I I never manage a band and say, hey, I, I want to manage you, and can I just jump on the horse and wherever you go, I, that's not my style. I, I want to bring an idea. I want to bring challenge. I want to, I want to, to be able to, to mine that diamond in its purest form yes. and then put it to the market. And if it's that fucking good, people are going to come. I'm getting so inspired, right? Oh my God. Okay. I have many questions about AFI and Avenge Sevenfold, but um, have you ever really wanted to work with a band and maybe they were like, eh, we don't really want to. And the reverse have has someone come to you and you're like, nah, and maybe you're like, ay, 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 what, what was I doing? You don't have to name names unless you want to. No, I mean, look, everyone makes mistakes. There's been a few bands that have wanted me to manage them in the past or, or meet in the past and I haven't. And there's and there's bands that I've also wanted that I haven't you know, gotten. Listen, there's, there's one band that I've always been obsessed with that I always like, if I got my hands on them, man, I would make them fucking Radiohead is Interpol. I love Interpol. Yes. Turn on the bright that. lights, antics. Our love to admire. I mean, these are records that to me have gotten, I mean, I just love the brand. I love who they are. Um, I think they're, I think they're an incredible band. I'd love, you know, I I always love them and you know, I don't know who manages them, but they're great. Um, And I don't take on everything. There's a lot of bands that want to meet that I say no to um, because I don't want to take on a band that's a business unless I'm inspired by their music and their art. Um, Avenged is a band that I've wanted to meet for, for a long time, you know, and the second they became available, I mean, I did everything and anything I could. I've just thought that they were such an incredible band, the musicianship, the professionalism, Matt as a front man is incredible, you know, sin and fucking Zachy. And I mean, Brooks is a monster, Johnny, they're, they're, I've watched them and they've been adjacent to me for so long because they've been on the festivals and they always play with the bands, but I've never interacted with them. Now that I've had a chance to open the hood and see how good they are, and this record, which is art. I mean, you talk about art yes. that will take time to stick. This is this is perfect example of what inspires me. A record that is polarizing, a record that pushes the envelope, a record that has art that is completely unexpected and will throw you for a curveball. But it's great. So you know what? Take a year and it'll be your favorite. It's not your, if it's not your favorite record now, no problem. That's what that that's 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 what system was. System wasn't accepted in the beginning. No. You know? No. So, um, you know, that's what I want. And so, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm careful about my bandwidth. I, I want to be involved with the bands. 
So I don't, I don't take on everything. I'm not a volume business at all. I'm, I'm a boutique by design and I want to keep it that way. Yeah. If there's a band that inspires me that I have to have, I'll go after it and we'll make, we'll make the room for it because that's what we do. But I preserve that, that soul power for the bands that I have. As we sit here today, life is but a dream is not out, but I've listened to the album three times all the way through and everything you said is so true. This is really art. Is someone going to be like one time through who is a hardcore Venge fan and they say, oh, this is the greatest thing ever? I don't know if they will, but if you have some patience and listen to it and get to the song Cosmic and yes. then the G.O.D. songs yes. and listen to the instrumentals that opens up the record and closes the record and put those headphones on and don't be distracted. Go on a hike, go on a jog, a long drive. This thing rules yes and that and that and that's you know i came in i got hired after they had made the record and they were starting to mix with with barisi and and here's a group of guys who are committed to art if you look at the album cover they got together with their 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 buddy wes lang who's an incredible yes. artist yep. um and they created this art and so this is music this is art in the form of music visually in terms of the way it sounds, what you'll see on the road when you see their production, you're not going to see production that you expect. You're not hearing a record you expect. That's what great artists do. They push the envelope. And, and I think their mentality is we are going to challenge our fans. We're not going to give them what they expect because if you give them what they expect after six years, what fun is that? And it's not as long as it's genuine. None of, nothing on here is made to order. This is what came out of them. This is what their experience was between the last record and this record. Right. Um, and my job is to promote that and to take it to the world and frame it in optics that have class, that have genuine, pure connection to the fans and take it to the world. And that's what they did. And you know what? If you like it, fuck yeah. If you like it, if you don't like it, no problem. Right. Not focusing on one song, <clears throat> but a collection of the work at a time. Is the audience and all of us, we're not as patient as we once were because there's so many distractions. Yeah. Smashing Pumpkins put out 33 songs recently, this whole rock opera. Oh, I'm I used like, to manage. Oh, you did? Yeah, I oh, managed wow. them for a while, yeah. Wow, and I'm like, wow, a collection of songs. I like that. Listening to this front to back, I'm like, I like that. Do you see that at all swinging in that direction with some of the bands that we all love? I think that the bands that are, <clears throat> the bands that have been around that went through and endured artist development and did the work. Yes. I believe they have more latitude to have bodies of work that take more time to, to ingest and to fall in love with. Right. Cause the Avenged Sevenfold or the Corn or Deftones, Alice system and, 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 and AFI, these are bands that have been around. So when you hear the name of that band, you you know what it is. It's that band. Okay. They have a new record or they have a new body of work. They have a new project. I think there's a little bit more time that kids will spend on it and the consumer because there's such history. Whereas a new band where they don't even get any artist development, it's all about a song or a TikTok right. 15 second clip. Right. So the health of the brand, if you look at the biggest bands in the world, they're the sans a few of the new ones. They're the older ones. It's the Pink Floyds, you know, Madonna, you know, Taylor Swift, who's been around, you know, um, Coldplay. These are bands that, you know, you too that have had the, the, the development time. And I never want it to be about a quick fix. Again, if, if Deftones next record comes out and there's a big hit on it, God bless. If this Avenged song goes number one, God bless. But it's not going to change the, traje the trajectory of their career. Because their career is based on 50 different things. And the song, the, the, the radio is one of them. And it's important and we do it and we like it and we want a 4 million a week audience. Great. We yeah. want to be, we want yeah. strikers saying, and here it is. Yeah. Believe yeah, me, yeah. we want that and we need that to an extent, but they're not going to, their success won't be predicated on it. Absolutely. Sick new world was just a couple weeks ago. What a lineup that was. Deftones, Corn, System of a Down and many other awesome bands. Incubus, a lot of SoCal love, a lot of West Coast love. You are the co-creator of of Sick New World. Before we get into how that festival came about, that's a rock festival that sold out, what is it, 70,000 people? 65, yeah. Like that. Yeah. Did anyone ever say to you, Bino, within the last eight years, Bino, rock is dead. What are you going to do, man? I mean, you've got these bands. Did, did that or no? That doesn't Oh, happen. yeah. No, no, no. I mean, there was a time when... <clears throat> It was all about SoundCloud rap and backpack hip hop and <laughs> and and all this stuff and you know Mark and I would have these talks. Mark, who who works with me, who's Mark who's, Wakefield, yeah, 
best best manager there is. Um, we would we would sit and and, and we'd kind of laugh at it because like, oh, Rock is dead. What are you gonna do? And we're like, I don't know. We're selling tickets. We're selling. We're putting asses in seats and selling T-shirts. And these brands, like, it's they'll, they'll, kids will figure out what's real, and right. it's real. It's, right. real. it's real. They got to come out and play these songs. They have to play their instruments. They have to bang. They have to fucking sing. They have to. They have to execute. I think there's something to be said for that. And so um, we just kind of stuck to our guns and shut our mouths and just and just and just hunker down. And as, as a wise man once told me, do what you do well and stick to your fucking lane. And that's what we did. And that's what we do. So um, you know. So I think that I've never I've never sort of um, managed out of fear. We just do what we do, and you either get there or you don't. Putting together Sick New World with the lineup that you did, was it a stressful thing? Was it a no-brainer that everybody knew how many tickets were going to be sold? From your perspective leading up to it, give me some details on it, Bino. <laughs> yeah, I mean— Even the artwork is awesome for Sick New World. Yeah, I mean, well, I never manage by comfort. I manage by stress. I manage by intensity. I manage by, like, we better be the best. Yeah. So it's never like, oh, this is cool. It's more like— we got to We got to create something spectacular here. Um, and I was with my dear friend Michael Rapino having a meeting one day, and Omar, uh, who works with Michael, um, and runs the show there with them, came up to me and said, "Hey, this guy Jeffrey Schumann, he's great. He's an amazing promoter. I want you to meet him, Jeffrey, who's put together, you know, when we were young festival and a bunch of other ones." Right. Yeah. Um, he and I sat down and we discussed that there's no rock brand at the festival level that has an ethos of mystery, sexiness, you know, uh, danger, all in one. You know, I think the the, the Wimmer people, uh, Gary and Danny and Dell, have done an incredible job waving the rock flag. I mean, they are hugely important to rock in the marketplace and totally. give them a tremendous amount of love and respect. They've been so fucking good to my bands. Um, when we wanted to do something that didn't take away from what they were doing, but that was different. And and something that, that was really dramatic visually, um, when you look at the, the when you look at the artwork and then put together what we felt was a lineup that was undeniable, you know, and so I had sort of like this idea, and Jeff and I just discussed like what about this West Coast power, this West Coast, you know, and you what if, what would happen if you took System and Deftones and Corn and Incubus and and sprinkled in some 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 you know some goth and some you know right. some other some industrial and that's where the brilliance of Jeff came in with like sort of like balancing it out and together between the visuals the vision that I had and and his and his you got this amalgam of this festival that was whether it was you know the Melvins or Health to Turnstile to System yes. to Bungle yes. to you know she wants revenge right. one of the most underrated like and it just worked it clicked somehow it hit the nerve between hard rock, goth, industrial, indie, shoegaze, and, you know, you had your spirit boxes on there, and you had nice. your seven dusts on there. And 100 it, Gex. 100 the Gex. Yeah. Absolutely, which bands love, that band, you know? And so it it it, it came out, and it sold out on the on sale. And awesome. most importantly, you know, when you, went, you were there, you went there and you saw... Yeah a production that could house these giant bands and, a, and, a, and, and the grounds that felt good and looked good and the cabanas and the bands had a great time. The fans did, and we've launched a brand. And so there, for me, as I manage the bands, there's always a sense of being precious to, to not do anything that's not right for the brand. And for me, for my, in my opinion, sick new world is a brand that should be precious and it's special and we need to, program it that way. You know, there's always going to be business. I get that. But I think that together live nation and Jeffrey Schumann and I together have done something and created something that, that has a shot. So you think you'll do it again next year? Yes, I do. We're nice. already, we've already made a couple offers. Good, 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 good. Did <laughs> who will be on? Please answer this. Look at me in the eye. Cause I, I hope the answer is yes. Did System have a good time at the show? They did. They did 30 songs, basically. It looked like they were having fun. And they did. Listen, when when when, <laughs> when Dolmayan calls you the next day, who's not a, who's not easy. John Dolmayan. expects a lot, which yes. I love. He keeps me on my toes. Yep. He says, dude, that was the fucking best festival I've played. No. I'm like, wow. You know, so. No, I know they did. I know they had fun. I talked to Darren and Chavo, John, Serge. You know, they, they, they had fun. And you saw them having fun, which is great. And I saw the people having fun. I was standing right out there watching... Uh, 
Incubus. It was like one after another just hitting us over the head. Do you get happy when you see fans of these bands having a good time out oh, there? Oh, amazing. And I'm a fan. Like I was, I remember walking out when Incubus <laughs> went on and I, and I saw Mikey on stage. Oh, God. And Jesus, I, I looked at him and he opened with, with, they opened with Privilege, which yes. is a song that I fucking love and think is so. <sighs> And like, I just kind of like, I was like, I was just like, and I just love watching them and Brandon and they just, they look, there's just such a great, that's a, that's another incredible band underrated, but so special. Definitely. Can we talk about AFI? Absolutely. Davey Havoc to me is one of the best front people. He is also at the top of my list. He is someone that I don't think will sacrifice his art for a dollar. And I think sometimes he fights with himself maybe to even do stuff that seems like it's a the slam dunk. Of course you're going to do this. What is it like working with Davey and the band? First of all, Davey is one of the best people I know. He is, he is the epitome of class. Um, Jade, Davey, Hunter, and Adam yes. are incredible people. These are guys that you talk about a, a, a collaborative effort. That's what they are. Davey is a true artist. Davey will look you in the eye and say, I, I would rather not be in a band than do certain things. Wow. And when someone says that to you, they're open for interpretation and, and challenge. But when they say that to you, that's a declaration, right? When someone declares something and they mean it, then your job is to either try and talk them or show them a different way or, or challenge them. But ultimately you have to respect that. And I respect that. You know, I mean, there's, there, there's, there's, there's challenges we have and we've been through it, and you know about Sing the Sorrow, and that wasn't something that Davey initially wanted to do, but I think he saw the value of it in his band members, and, and they did it, and it was hugely successful. Right. And, and that's okay, you know? But Davey, to his credit and to my chagrin, sometimes will say, I'm not willing to do that, whether it's a, a certain style, and that's okay because that's who he is. And ultimately, I'm attracted to that because someone who is an artist that's great and they're great, and they commit to something, and they declare, and they put the they put the stake in the sand. Yeah. I, I respect it. Can you tell me about Jerry Cantrell? This guy has been in most of our lives professionally for as long as we can remember. And I hear his voice, and I watch some of the old YouTube videos with him and Lane. And, and in that time back then, I just thought it was awesome, but I didn't realize that that's genius Hall of Fame status right there. Yeah. So what's it? What's... Jerry like professionally and as a guy and what's it like working with him specifically? Jerry's a pro, you know, he, he is a pro, you know, whether it's rehearsal or writing. I mean, he's, he's very, very disciplined as an artist. Um, you saw, he goes out on a solo and we'll go bang out, you know, months and months on solo work and, you know, play smaller rooms than, than Alice, but committed to the art, committed to his body of work. Obviously uh, one of the great guitar players and writers, you know, Alice was a band that when I was 24, I would call the lawyer, Lisa Sokransky, when she worked at Peter Paterno's office. I said, Alice, coming out with a new record, you know, Facelift and Dirt were two records that I idolized before I was ever in the music business. Those are two records that inspired me to even be in the music business. So to, to later on be able to work with this band and and have them be um, as in demand and and relevant as they are is, is super special, you know? So, um, you know, I sat with Jerry in his car uh, three weeks ago, we went to lunch and he's like, okay, man, I'm gonna play you some new stuff. And he played me some new solo stuff for his next record. And I yeah. was like, fucking amazing. It's, it's evolved. And we sit in his car and we listen to it and it's amazing. Oh, and so, man. um, it's, it, it's great. I mean, that's the stuff, that's the stuff, those moments with my clients that inspire me beyond anything is that interaction and that ability to like, listen and talk about the art and, and chase the greatness once the art is great. Velvet Hammer Music and Management Group. I've been to your offices. There is the most beautiful art on the wall. How does that art on the wall inspire or influence you? I mean, you know me and you've watched me, so you know that that I never, um, I'm never attracted to some quick trend or quick fix. I'm more like a slow moving beast. And art, art visually and sonically. Uh, to me, whether it's interior design or architecture, music, art has always um, affected me and created a a, a, a a serious perspective change to life in a good way. And so when you come in the office and you see that art, like yes. each one of those pieces has been collected over the past 20 years and in my home as well. And um, I believe that that art exudes real spirituality and energy in the workplace that affect the way people um 
behave and act and can work. Like I wanted Velvet Hammer to be a building and a place where you come in and you say, this is unique. It's different. It's one of one. I love being here. Fuck. I need to step up to be here Yes, because I believe that for my clients every day, I have to step up. I have to be better today than I was yesterday and better tomorrow than I was today for my clients. If I'm not, they should be with a different manager. I need to deliver for them and have that edge and that chip on my shoulder. And so how do I do that? What's the environment I create? It's art. And that's who I am. And that's who Velvet Hammer is. We are, if you come to the office, you'll understand the culture of this company. And that art on the wall is just as important to me as anything. That's why when I look at this beautiful Wes Lang work and this on this cover or the last Deftones LP, I'm like, that's art. That's fucking art. Right. That's, 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 thank you. That's potent to me. And that's what inspires. You were a, you were just one person that started a company. How did you decide to hire another person and another person? Like what was happening and how did you decide exactly what you needed with your company? Like no one laid out a blueprint for you. You, you know, I followed. Is my that nose. a dumb question? No, no, no. I mean, because like my my own mom's like, well, so how did you do that? Why? Yeah, <laughs> you know, I, how did you become a big radio personality? You followed your nose. You followed your passion. You followed what was what you did really well. Yeah, thanks. And so I felt like I felt this. I felt like the discipline of the management. I am a micromanager by nature. Um, I felt like it was something I did well, and I felt like the my artistic perspective as well as the the thoroughness and detail orientation was something I did well. So I just kind of started to do it. Um, and none of it would be where it's at without Mark Wakefield. Um, you know, he is probably, you know, in terms of literacy and ability to see far, probably the smartest manager I know. Wow. Um, I'm a visionary, wow. but he's the smartest guy I know. And I have an amazing staff and Samantha and Taryn and all my staff. They're, they're, they're amazing. I wouldn't be able to do what I do without them. Um, but it started way back in the day and, and, and Mark, how'd you came. meet Mark Wakefield? So Mark it's funny cause Mark, I used to manage a band called zero. I know who zero was. Zero was Lincoln park. Zero was Lincoln park. You and managed zero. Mark Wakefield was, was the Chester. singer. He was yes. the Chester. Yes, he was. Rest in peace. Yes. And I was hanging out with them and managing them. And, and Mark was the business guy and he brought me in <laughs> and, um, and you know, they did a series of, uh, deals with people. And I don't think Mark was that into at the time. And, and ultimately I don't think he wanted to be on the mic. I think he wanted to be in the business. Um, and I ended up parting ways with them for one reason or another. And Mark came to me. It's like, I want to be, I want to be your protege. I want you to mentor me. And he came in and he, he was 19 and he worked no as an way. intern for me for like a year and a half. And I had an employee there and my first employee and Mark, I remember sitting me down one day after he'd been there for me. He was like, I'm not reporting to him. I'm, I'm leapfrogging him. I'm coming to you. And he, he and I just started doing it and it, it became this, this incredible team and we built around it. And, you know, there's been different people throughout the years, as you know, there's turnover, but he's yeah. been with me forever and uh, it's been incredible and we've killed it. He doesn't need to hear this from me at all. But I give him so much kudos from coming from that position that he was in as a frontman at a band. Yeah. And of course, Linkin Park sold 150 zillion records, et cetera, et cetera. And he has had the eye of the tiger on the other side of the business. And for here to hear you say those things about him makes yeah. me proud of him uh, for everything that he has done in his yeah, career. He's been, it's he's, just he's, so cool, man. It's been amazing. It? And by the way, there's someone who's absolutely committed to the like what's right for the band. Not what's right for the situation of the label or the promoter or the this or the immediate. Like we all have our partners. Everyone needs the promoters. Everyone needs the labels. Everyone, we're all a team. But ultimately, his mind goes to what's right for the band. Like how will this affect the band? You know, who is the artist that you work with that texts you the most? That texts me the most? Yeah. <sighs> Jonathan Davis or John Domayan? Really? Yeah. <laughs> I love my I love my my text every day around four o'clock, and it just says beans, and it's JD. I'm like JD, what up? Yeah. Like I'll send him the pictures of the Mark Rydens, and Domayan and I fucking prank people. We prank Mark. We prank the business manager. Like you know, we, so I, I'd say those two <laughs> those, those two guys. I text them, I text with Abe a lot. You know? Yes. Yeah. Abe's yeah, down yeah, in yeah. Nashville. You know, he hit me this morning. He's down in Nashville. They're doing some writing with uh with uh with the band down in Nashville. Oh, you know, cool. I text with him a lot. So you know. Uh, I text with Jade this morning. You know, he, he and really? I were making some jokes. Yeah. Oh, 
I yeah, love my Jade. Jade. Yeah. Love Jade. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, just incredible musicianship, incredible writer, just low key, lets the results speak, lets the art speak. I just, I'm lucky, you know, we're really lucky to have the artists we have. There's a 21 year old watching us who's a musician or in a band. It doesn't matter the genre. And they're pretty good. What's the advice that you would give them? Work hard and find in you what only you possess. Find something original. What about you? What about you as an artist is something that's different that no one else can do that you do better in the world, better than anyone in the world. That's what I believe in. That's what I believe in my art. I believe that my artists in what they do, they are the best in the world at what they do. And if it's that good, then you'll get your shot. I also think that artists need to stop following trend and what's hot now. I think that's, that's garbage. It's hogwash. It's ambulance chasing. I don't like to ambulance chase. I think there's a very big difference between trend and cultural movement. Cultural movement is, is a big difference. You know, when you heard dan dan it and you heard that symbol on right. the radio and corn right. first came out blind oh, it opened it was you had these white dudes with dreads in adidas it blurred the lines between hip hop metal rock alternative whatever it was and it was a mo- cultural movement that 25 years later is back and bigger than ever because it's not a trend trend goes away movement cultural movement managed properly last forever. And that's, that's what I believe in. And I think there's just so much talent out there, but I also think that because these kids are so young and they've been taught that instant grat and swipe left and swipe right. Yeah, yeah. That's not what it's about. The art is everlasting. It's an evergreen. It should be dealt with that way. You know, when you look at someone like Taylor Swift, what do you think it is about her and her talent and her songwriting and her skills that has led to this career where she can sell out SoFi stadium where the Rams and the Chargers play seven, eight nights. Yeah. Taylor Swift is real. You know, her impurities, her plight, she shares with the fans. Her music's great. She made a great record. Um, There's controversy, which brings the attention, but when the attention's on her, she delivers. Right. You know, Taylor Swift is real. She's only getting bigger. She's real. There's no doubt about it. She's real. When you met Avenged Sevenfold for the first time, you knew their songs, you knew who the guys were. Is there anything that surprised you about them? Not on record, but like not listening to a record. Smarts, poise. Mm. Here's a band that hadn't made a record in 76 years. And there was no desperation. There was no, we got it, we got it, we got it. It's here, this is what we do. Here's our music. They started sending me songs. They trusted me enough to, to send me songs and, 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 and ask me my opinion on some mixes. Um, they have a vision they are an incredible team internally. They have their roles. And I, was, I, I think I was really impressed by just their poise. They're just poised. And you know Matt. Uh, you speak to him a lot. Um, they're bright guys. Very. You know, I mean, very these bright. are, and I like that. I, I want to be in business with people that when I leave the phone or I leave a meeting, I'm like, I better be the best Beano I can be because they're fucking damn good. And that's, that's what I got from them. Wow. And this record is uh, is unbelievable. The way you bring it to the table and the way they do, it's just a recipe for success. Like you just coming over today, Sean, my camera guy and great editor over here, we're like A game today, A plus game, 20 minutes before they're even supposed to be here. You better be ready. I better be looking sharp. This is sharp for me, by the way. My hair's got to be de- And it's like, let's. there is no slack. Once you slack, you're not going to get to the place you want to Ma- go to. Mamba, Mamba mentality. Yes, Straight I love up. That. And Matt and I talk about that like, I'm not the right manager for every band. I'm intense. I am fucking intense. I want to be great. I want the records to be the greatest they can be. I want to chase greatness. I want to deliver. I want to know that my clients feel like, fuck, Velvet Hammer has brought something to the table that no one in the world has or can. That's what we are. I want. I, I, I have that Kobe mentality. Rest in peace. He's one of the biggest influences in my life. That Jordan killer instinct. That's how we are. That's 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 that is what I am, and I can't change. And that may not be right for every band, but I think that the bands that do give us the opportunity to earn their trust and deliver on all fronts, I, I believe that they have and will see results. Um, for the bands that we've been talking about that you work with. You've said so many times, great guys, smart guys, hardworking. They're very competitive. Have you come across professional musicians 
and maybe they don't feel like they're great humans for whatever reason, and that turns you off? Or is it about the art, not about the person that's doing the art? No, if someone's a, if someone's a, a scumbag, I don't want to work with them. I don't want to work with bad people. I just don't. And I'm not saying I have to agree with them yeah. because we can disagree and we can have different views on things. But a bad, like if someone's not a good person, um, and, and I won't name names, but I have had a couple in my 25 year career that I've just like, you know, we need to, we just need to, we need to part ways. Um, because there was just a vibrational disparity, um, for better or worse. And we just didn't see eye to eye on life and just tr the way, the way you treat people to me, respect is important. Whether you're an intern or a CEO, everyone gets the same amount of respect. You don't get the same amount of money. You don't get the same amount of, uh, latitude because you know, this is a team and the best people will play. But respect is respect. Um, do you ever have to really like turn it up a few notches when you're talking with either a promoter or a record label because they're not delivering the way they need to for your artist? 100%. And what is that like for you to do that? I think I think it has to be delivered with respect. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think our 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 reputation is is that they're incredible, honest, but they're tough. They expect a lot. And I do. You want to work with Deftones? You want to work with Avenge? You want to work with AFI, System Corn, Alice? Okay, I expect a lot. I expect the best. If you can't give the best, you can't have the best. And I believe that these are the best brands in the world. And certainly, if you look at them, they are so each one of these bands is so unique yeah. and can do only what that band can do right. in their brand, in their in their world, in their and some of them blur. You know, some of them stay in their lane, and they're, and some of them can blur. There's been a I don't care if you're if you're the weekend or you're Pantera or you're Turnstile or you're Black Sabbath, you want to play with Deftones. They've blurred it. Yes. You know? Right. So like and some bands blur it. So that's a beautiful thing. And and my job is to make sure that there's that there is blurred lines. I've been asked probably ten times in the last two years, specifically about Deftones, Corn, System, Incubus. How do these guys sell so many tickets to their shows? And I always have said, oh, they've got great songs and they've put in the work for years. But I thought of something else, and I know this is not rocket science, and I want to throw it at you. Okay. All of these guys toured in vans at one point, mm -hmm. and they earned the fandom one person at a time. And the person that would watch those bands, maybe they saw them opening up for another band, knew that they're grinding and everyone respects a grind. And so you earned our respect with that grind. Yeah. And you're still here doing it. You grinded. You didn't get here from TikTok, which is okay if someone made it from TikTok right. or a YouTube thing or right. a TV show. You were out there doing the work and doing the art. And so I'm still here for you. Yes. That, and, they, and they did. That, they, they put in that time and those fans the time you know, when they, they were when they were in the a time. small club yes you know and there was and in the front the <laughs> person in the front was getting the sweat from the singer like that was those were those were teeny they were teeny then and then they just slowly but surely got bigger and bigger and put in the time put in the tours opening tours second third then penultimate then they had like this this is 25 years in the making so you know you look at metallica who has probably done i don't know 20,000 shows in their life. Who knows? <laughs> but like they from garage days. Yes. All the way to stadiums. Like they are bulletproof in terms of their touring because they, they built the blocks. They, they, built they the earned, blocks. they built the right. fans, you know? And, and to me as, as a manager, the most important thing I can, I can, I can give a band or I can work with on a band. Like my, my goal with them is if you could sell out, if you could sell tours, you're safe. That's what it's about, selling tickets. What's the hard ticket? Can you go out and tour? Can you call me up and say, Bean, we want to work this year, and can you go put tours on sales, uh, put tours on sale in arenas or stadiums or whatever it is and sell the tickets? That's the most powerful thing a band can have. So give me the order, top five, how a band makes money in 2023. And so in my mind, before you answer, I'm thinking of concert tickets and I'm thinking of merch at the top of the list. Like where are album sales? Where are streams? Like give me the order on how bands can be successful. Well, the streaming does matter. It does. Um, it does come in, you know, in fractions, but it comes in. Okay. All right. Uh, touring is big, you know, guarantees are guarantees. Uh, merchandise is huge. You know, there, some bands are doing catalog deals where they make an overall deal with a company that buys into their, oh, right. into their copyright and master. Um, so there's, there's, you know, I mean, 
Bob Dylan just sold his catalog for right hundreds Chili of Peppers million. did it. Chili Derek Peppers. from Sum 41 just did it. Yeah, so there, there's ways. Listen, that's the power of the brand. You know, those those guys deserve it. If 20 years later, 30 right. years later, they want to cash out and they want to sell their masters, why would they not deserve to reap those benefits? Some bands want to hold them. Some bands are open to selling them. God dang, man. Who wants to buy tuna on toast? Let's go. It's all for sale in five years from now. Oh, don't worry. I'll cut the deal with you. Okay, on. yes. Bino, I feel like we got so much great information today. Yes. Thank you for all your hard work over the years. You've inspired me, as you know, in so many different ways. And I think you guys do know that are watching or you're listening to Tuna on Toast, Velvet Hammer is the sponsor, the backbone to the Tuna on Toast podcast. And proud to do it. You know, um, let me just leave by saying that, you know, there's not many people in the world who take the slow, take the, the slow and steady and you have, and you do, and you've been a huge supporter of my bands, Thanks, and man. you always, always were, and always have been, and that means a lot to me. And you get it, and you'll get yours. Thank you, Bino. Yeah. Thank you so much. For I sure. really appreciate it. What an episode! Yeah. Wow. Killer. And I love this album. I mean, by the open way. that. I mean, West Lang. Got to give a shout to West Lang, who's just fucking so amazing as an artist. Had lunch with him yesterday. His studio, his ethos, his art um, is just. Is it's just unparalleled and it's so special and and look at this look at this album kids are gonna have to put they want to touch this and feel it. My favorite thing in albums growing up was reading the thank yous and where it was recorded because I always want to know who are these people they're thanking yeah and where is the studio isn't, what that, is great? This? isn't that great you get to open a record yes. remember Tower Records you'd go and buy a record oh. and open it yeah oh so great can you name a favorite band of yours of all time that you don't manage. The most inspirational bands all time for me are Pink Floyd, Led Zeppelin, um, Public Enemy and Hip Hop. In terms of just musicality and, and execution, Love the Police. Yeah. Just they had such amazing Depeche Mode for sure. A lot of 80s stuff. Depeche was hugely important. Um, you know, the cure amazing. Like the, when I was, when I was in, in high school and in, in elementary school in 83, 84, 85, I mean, you know, I was listening to new wave, you know, I was listening to that stuff. First yes. it was ska, then it was new wave, right? But all that new wave so stuff, Depeche Mode, cure Smiths, that Smith, sort of thing. Incredible. I don't yeah. know if that's necessarily new wave, but like, yeah, stuff but under Depeche that is like, here's a band that was influential in the eighties and as, as, as relevant today. Absolutely. Doing stadiums. Right. You know? And I want to give them some props. I've interviewed them a couple of times over the years. And recent, the nicest guys. Is that important for a band to be like, they don't need to be like ice cream, oh, everything's great, but just like rock stars, but nice at the same time. I don't. That's a combo that can't yeah, be taught. But look at them. Maybe that's one of the reasons they are where they are. Maybe, you know, the humility and that, that, that friendly vibration reverberates and when the world loves you, maybe there's an uplift there. I mean, I don't want to get corny, but like it's, it's, I believe in that stuff. I, I definitely I lead... I manage, I don't manage conventionally and you know, I definitely manage energetically. And I think it, for me anyway, it works. I mean, look at Jonathan Davis. People fucking love that guy. It's, you know, there's always, it always bounces their way. Maybe that's why, I don't know. You know, maybe Dave gone is, he's such a nice guy. I mean, I've met him before and their manager, Jonathan Kessler is an incredible guy too. Just salt of the earth, classy. Good maybe vibrations. That, good all vibrations. Right there, maybe right? that helps. What's super important I think in my career, but even bigger for bands, is making an authentic connection with each individual person that is checking you out. Whether it's hearing me on the radio, yes. Striker's talking to me directly right now yes. in, in a, a super authentic way. Yes. And you make that connection and you form this like a friendship through the radio, through a record or whatever it is. Everyone wants to feel heard. Everyone wants yes. to feel important. Everyone is important. If if you can connect with someone and they feel good and they feel there was a genuine connection. Whatever it is you connect about, you can be sure they're going to talk about it. Right. Whether it's a band, a situation, a guest speaker on your, on your show. Shavo connects individually one by one when he plays bass on stage. He For told sure. me that on the podcast. Well, if you watch him. He looks like this. And do you know why he does that? Do you know why? Why? Because he went to a Kiss show when he was 12 years old and G he thought Gene Simmons looked at him. Yeah. And he still remembers it. So he's like, if I'm ever on stage, I'm going to do that. So he's like, I got you. I yeah. got you. I got you. Yeah. I got you. And you watch Shava. Like I watched him last week at the show and he, he's the greatest <laughs> thing. He'll sit there and he'll point. He'll yes. Go, 
and he'll point at them and he'll like like he's he's indicating yeah you yeah you right and I love that and, and that's that's but Shava will get on stage in front of in, in in a stadium and headline it and then walk down the street and give someone a hug and mean it he means it right he's he does. his heart is sweet man alive yeah. all right chase greatness. Enjoy that the, is the arts. Velvet Hammer way. Chase Respect greatness. Respect the arts. He is Vino, the founder, the CEO of Velvet Hammer Music and Management Group. And that's been another Tuna on Toast episode for Vino. I'm Stryker. Happy snuggles. Bye-bye. Yeah. Hope you enjoyed. Now hit that subscribe button. And for more Tuna on Toast, listen wherever you get your podcasts.